a, just sort of a preface to it, is that these stories, particularly this story, is one of our oldest stories that we tell. Um, I am not an elder. I'm also not a storyteller practicing and working on it. Um, so honestly, it's more appropriate for me to read the story itself, um, how we've interpreted the prophecies is that way, but then also kind of leave it up to a QA. and I know the Q&A is sort of left for afterwards, but I encourage you guys, if there's a question that you have or something that arises during the presentation, please ask that question. I think first and foremost is, is I have to say uh, thank you to uh, Sandy and the staff here at Marshall County. Um, these are really big steps. Um, it seems like this would be something pretty frequent or common in 2023, but it really isn't. Um, I have to say, you know, miigwech, thank you for, you know, taking that initial scary first step in building relationships and friendships and cooperatives. Um, it's still very rare in this day and age um, for indigenous communities to work with non-native institutions and communities as well to do cooperative projects. Um, it can be very scary to take that initial step, that plunge feet first, um, but that's just how you have to do it. So I have to thank Sandy and the staff here for doing that. Um, we're very humbled and appreciative um, that they reached out to us and allowed us to assist them in creating an exhibit um, so that the community can actually interpret and voice its own history um, with its own through its own lens and with its own words. So thank you very much, Chi Thank you. Thank you. So as some of you guys can tell, um, this story has been told over millennia. Um, so for more than 11 centuries, our ancestors have recounted and endured the prophecies of the seven fires. A thousand years ago, when the Anishinaabe lived along the East Coast, um, really where uh, Maine, New Brunswick is today, um, there were eight prophets that brought seven warnings to the people of a dangerous future that the people would have to face and ultimately endure. Um, over many generations, each revelation or fire as it's known as um, has come to pass. And these fires um, have interpreted and have been shaped over time. And through these teachings have helped Anishinaabe know who they were in the past, are in the present, and ultimately will be in the future. So I think first and foremost, let me kind of educate everybody on what Anishinaabe actually means. Um, you'll see it frequently used throughout the presentation. What Anishinaabe is, is a word that's used to describe a cultural and a spiritual confederacy amongst three distinct groups of people. First would be the Ojibwe, the next would be the Odawa, and last would be Bodawadmi or Potawatomi. Um, Bodawatomi is the correct phonetic way of saying uh, Potawatomi. Um, but each group um, considers themselves to be one people, and each one of them serve the group as a whole. Um, during this migration, I'll explain it a little bit more in the story, but over a 500 year migration, um, the group separated from one common group into three distinct groups. And the way that each one of them is broken off and recognized is through a, the traditional way is that if you are able to build fire, um, which is a means of being able to protect yourself, obviously provide warmth and uh, sustainability, but also a way in which you use to pray to the creator, that you can be deemed as your own individual people and be named as such. So the first one to break off are the Ojibwe. We consider them the eldest brother. Um, they're the keepers of the medicine or the keepers of the religion. So old ancient scrolls, um, medicine teachings and songs. The, sec the second to break off was the Odala, the middle brother. And they are known as the keepers of the trade. Um, so they were known as establishing and protecting trade networks between Anishinaabe groups and other intertribal alliances. And the last to break off from the group or the youngest brother were the Bodawadmi. And their name translates to keepers of the fire. And what that means is, is that it's symbolic, it's metaphorical to know that you were the last, you were the youngest, so you were the ones who were charged with honoring and letting people know that you belong to a bigger group of people, that you are here to respect and to perpetuate with this cultural fire that binds all of us together. So that is why Potawatomi are known as keepers of the fire. So the first fire, and I'll explain what some of this imagery is. It's also metaphorical. 
Um, it was said, and it was introduced to the people by the first prophet, is that in the time of the first fire, the Anishinaabe must leave their home on the east coast and follow the sacred Migas shell of the Medellin Lodge. The sacred Migas will lead them on a journey to the chosen ground and their new home. The Anishinaabe are to look for a turtle-shaped island at the beginning and at the end of their journey. The journey will consist of seven stopping places along the way, and they will know their journey has ended when they come to a place where food grows on water. If they do not make this journey, they will be destroyed by a powerful force coming over the water. So over years, we've interpreted this. And the way that we've interpreted it is, is that when the people gather to begin this 500 year migration and responding to the prophecy, the Anishinaabe began a mass migration west. So from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Maine, they began to travel west down the St. Lawrence River. And guided by the sacred Negus shell, in the Medewin Lodge, uh, the people gathered around what was known as the first turtle-shaped island, which we know as Maniac. Um, it's near present-day Montreal. Um, the Anishinaabe continued their journey following the Migas to a resting place known as Niagara Falls today, but to us as Kitchen Asajwan. It was here that the three related groups that I have described um, broke apart, forming the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodawadni. And joined through heritage and spirituality, each one of them continue to serve the group as a whole. Now the turtle, or all as we know it as Mashike, um, it's a very revered spirit. Um, it plays a serious role in ceremonies, um, as well as our creation story. Um, and through that story is, it's thought that when the creator was angered, um, he, flooded, he flooded the earth. Many of us are aware of deluge stories through many cultures and religions. Um, but once he flooded the earth, the only things that were able to survive were those animals that could swim and fly, but also the spirit of original man known as Nanabojo. And through camaraderie and through assisting each other, they were able to secure some dry land so that they could rebuild the earth. However, they did not have a dry place to put this earth on to rebuild it. So Turtle, seeing that they needed, he sacrificed his shell and allowed them to place the dry earth on his shell. And in doing this and creating this and, and making this sacrifice, the creator decided that he was going to gift life back to the people and create a new world. So what we feel as we live today is on Turtle Island. So that is why we revere the turtle in itself. But for this particular story, it symbolizes the first and the last stopping places on their journey. You can kind of see here the map that they took. So they traveled from New Brunswick and the first second, third stops, and as they migrated north, this is when they started to kind of break apart. Now over this 500 year migration, there were many, many stops that were made. Um, there were some places they would rest, population would grow, some would decrease. They also had to face other intertribe, intertribal warfare and other means and things like that that would decrease the population, but also cause them to sort of scatter about. But ultimately everybody would come back together. And in knowing this, this would sort of take heed into the prophecy itself and understand that the second fire, the next fire, was about to ignite. So in the second fire, it's known as the Anishinaabe will be camped by a large body of water. In this time, the direction of the Migas will be lost, and the ancient Adewan will diminish in strength. To regain the strength, a boy will be born, and he will point the way back to the traditional ways of life. So what you see here is one rendition of the inside of a Medewin Lodge. And I'll kind of explain what Medewin is. Medewin is recognized as the oldest formal um, spiritual religious uh, denomination, if you will, amongst the people. It's not only practiced by Anishinaabe groups, it's also practiced by many Algonquin and Great Lakes peoples. So even the Menominee, the Ho-Chunk, um, as well as the Anishinaabe. Um, each one of these lodges can be constructed a little bit differently, um, whether it's a four-sided lodge or it actually is domed, sort of like a wigwam, a traditional lodge that we would have. But oftentimes it was always open air this way. Um, there's some misconceptions on this being a, a secret society, a secret medicine society. It definitely was not. This was at the religious heart of everybody. Um, often today that we would sort of see in North America as sort of being Christianity. Um, it's at the heart of everything. And it's an unfortunate in these times that spirituality is almost like a novelty these days. 
Um, it really doesn't play a major role as it used to, um, to where it was at the heart of births and deaths, marriages, things like that. This is what Medewin was. Now, there were practitioners that we loosely refer to as priests. It was a multi-stratified society, um, some with four rankings, others with eight, and both men and women could participate in this religious society. But based upon your ranking, uh, determined how much knowledge you had of botanical medicines. Um, and specifically, it was that. It was a religious based on healing. So knowledge of these therapeutic and medicinal medicines and botanicals, but also the songs that went along with that so that you could commune with Creator and the spirits played a major part in your ranking within the society. And each one of them had um, uh, different uh, demarcations and things like that. Uh, certain things that they would wear in ceremony, the way that they would mark their face. Um, as it was said, I'll do a presentation tomorrow on Wabunzi, and oftentimes you'll see him as depicted with a red line throughout his face. And what that marks is, is that he was a high-ranking priest in the Medeiwin society, a fourth-ranking priest. Um, but you can see here that people would enter the lodge, and oftentimes there would be gifts and things that were hanging on the wall in terms of blankets. Now, people would come in here for initiation rites to become Medewin practitioners, um, often sort of through uh, um, theology school and things like that for, for, for priests and other denominations. They would do the same thing here. But oftentimes, members of the community who would be allowed to come into this space um, for namings, um, for birthrights, for rites of passage, um, even for death as well. Um, but this was at the heart and center of the community. Everybody um, would have been Medewin or practiced in some form of Medewin. So, during the second fire, as was interpreted, it was realized that at present day, the Detroit River, the people continued west and camped between Lake Erie and Lake Huron, but the Migas was lost. Struggling to locate the correct path, the Anishinaabe again settled and increased in numbers, and as numbers grew, spiritualism and teachings of the Medewin became secondary to survival. But as predicted, a boy was born who led the Anishinaabe to the spiritual and physical stepping stones of the future. Continuing north along Lake Huron, the Anishinaabe discovered a chain of islands. And on Manitoulin Island, the people rested. And it was here that the Medewin Lodge resumed its strength. You probably saw earlier that we had an otter um, who was sort of symbolizing this fire. The otter is seen as a guide. Um, in this particular story, we refer to the Migas, which is a cowrie shell, that is a spiritual shell that is used. Um, but in other renditions of this story, instead of the Migas, it's actually an otter who leads the path. Um, but he's also a major um, uh, protagonist in a lot of stories as well, so through our seven grandfather teachings um, and other stories such as that. So in this, he's kind of seen as a guide, as a teacher. Um, but he represents the people's rediscovery of spiritual strength and their guide to a path to a new homeland. The third fire, the Anishinaabe will find the path to their chosen ground. This is a land to the west, and this is where they must find the food that grows on water. So interpret it. Energized from their cultural and spiritual revival, the Anishinaabe were again led by the Migas to their next stop. And this was known as Sinachawan, um, or today known as Salt St. Marie. Uh, Mama Gosnan, or Creator, provided an abundance of food and the people flourished and expanded. The Anishinaabe finally continued their journey west, and at the shore of Lake Superior they separated. One group north around the water and the other south. Years later the two groups met at the western end of the lake and the sacred shell rose from the waters again. And this was at the sixth stop, known today as Spirit Island. There they had found the, the prophetic food that grew on water, which today we know as Monoman. <laughs> now, wild rice is more than just a food staple in the Great Lakes. It's also a, a therapeutic food. It's used for gastrointestinal issues, heart issues as well, but it's also known as a ceremonial and a medicine food that's used during specific ceremonies and rites of passage. So for when young women are tra transitioning into womanhood, they usually go on what's known as a berry and a ricing fast, to where that's the only foods that they will consume in the entire year. Um, but also, it's so important that this is the first solid food that's given to babies, and it's also the last food that's given to people before they pass away, before they walk on. 
So realizing that their migration was concluding, the Anishinaabe sought out the promised turtle-shaped island that would signify their journey's end. Remembering a place nearby, the people returned to the island, known today as Madeline Island, off the coast. The spiritualist placed tobaccos on its shores and in its waters, and the Migas rose again from the water, proclaiming the people's coveted destination. I'll kind of double back here. So metaphorically, the pipe, or Ganoje as we would call it, um, is an honored spirit as well that represents fish and great sea clans within the people. Um, but what's really metaphorical about this is, is that naturally pike use wild rice um, patties, um, stands if you will, um, as nurseries for their young. Um, so as they use these, um, metaphorically speaking, it's also the same as what the Anishinaabe use the wild rice for as well. So as to protect their young, to protect their way of life, and to do that. So for the fourth fire. In the time of the fourth fire, the Anishinaabe was addressed by two prophets who spoke of the coming of a light-skinned race of people. The two prophets arrived together, predicting the coming of a light-skinned race as either friends or foes. These strangers could bring marvels and friendship, or they could bring a path of destruction. This was then at the center of all the prophecies. This took precedence. It was the great turning point that predicted the people's future. Contact with a light-skinned race did occur, but at different times, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. The Potawatomi met the French first in 1634 on the shores of Green Bay. French traders offered new and valuable trade goods. As missionaries and soldiers followed, a powerful alliance formed between the two nations. However, as North American control fell to Britain and then later the Americans, the fourth fire did come to light. The Anishinaabe and other native nations were being displaced by white settlements, creating tensions and war, not only with the colonial powers, but also other intertribal alliances. Land disputes led to the American Treaty era and the acculturation of Native America that ignited the fifth fire. Now the snake, known as Ginebec, um, our answers des describe the Europeans as speaking in half-truths, as using a forked tongue like the snake would use. Uh, so Anishinaabe associate the snake with powerful malevolent spears and their destructive paths. But for this, we actually chose a real species of snake, the Mississauga rattlesnake, which is, or used to be, the only venomous snake in the Great Lakes. It's very small, and it's very reserved. So oftentimes how indigenous groups saw colonial powers as bearing very weak and meek. They couldn't survive the winter. They had no way, they had no subsistence strategies. They had to assist with them for their survival. Oftentimes that can be paralleled with the snake. It's small, but if you get close to it, it's very dangerous. And if it bites you, it will likely kill you with its venom. So that is why we use the snake to metaphorically represent this fire. What was the name of that kind again? Mississauga? Mississauga rattlesnake? So in the time of the fifth fire, the Anishinaabe were told of a time of great struggle that would grip the lives of all native people. Within the fifth fire, they were told of one who holds a promise of great joy and salvation. If the people accept the promise and abandon their old traditional teachings, then the struggle of the fifth fire will scorch the people for many generations. The promise that comes will prove to be a false promise. All those who accept this promise will cause the near destruction of the people. Now the way in which that we have interpreted the fifth fire is the acculturation of indigenous people resulting from the swift colonization of the Great Lakes region. Um, reliance on foreign trade goods created internal conflicts, not only among Potawatomi groups and Anishinaabe groups, but other intertribal regional alliances. Um, traditional social and spiritual ideals were fractured, and some of them permanently. This instability led to regional and generational warfare that the United States exploited to create peace treaties and ultimately land sessions and removals. So we use the Mako as a representative for this fire. And the Mako, the bear, is a powerful spirit. Um, it's also representative of uh, the bear clan in itself. 
but what the bear is known as is it's a protector. It's known for policing. Bear clan people are known as for policing the people. But in doing that and having to traverse around and police around the area, they also became um, very knowledgeable about botanical plants and nature that they were always commonly in. So in doing that, they know that they were protectors, but they were guardians of medicines. Um, so here, the Mako expresses the fight to save the way of life for the people. In the sixth fire, the Anishinaabe will know that the promise of the fifth fire was false. Those deceived by the promise will take the children away from their traditional teachings of the elders, turning the children against their elders. The elders will lose their reason for living and their purpose in life. Within this fire, sickness will plague the people, disturbing their natural balance and nearly destroying their way of life. So what we understand this to be as assimilation, and it was introduced to a people um, through religious and government leaders, and it was enticing because it was thought to be a way to speed up that assimilation and acculturation process. And being able to do this is to um, enlist your children in boarding schools, to take them from their communities and start teaching them a Western or Anglo way of life. Um, so whether enrolled by choice or by duress or even force, children were stripped of their native identities, you know, critically affecting native languages, culture, and spirituality for future generations. Now the animal that we use to symbolize this fire is um, what we know as Sheshko or the muskrat. Um, and the muskrat is a hero of our creation story. So as I told you, the only animals that could swim and fly or the only animals that were able to survive the Great Flood were animals who could swim or fly, and the muskrat being one of those. All of the animals tried, including Nanabojo, and all of them failed, except for the muskrat. And in doing so, he sacrificed himself to grab that piece of earth underneath the waters and bring it up to the surface. Um, so in doing that, he symbolizes the hardship of the elders and what they had to face, um, knowing that, honestly, their purpose in life um, was gone at this point. Elders' purpose are to be teachers, to perpetuate life ways, cultural understandings, ideals, to teach those parables to the younger generation. And since they don't have the opportunity, their existence is meaningless. But what, the, what Sheshko represents is that hardship and knowing that they were going to have to survive and knowing that they were going to have to stick around, dig their heels in, and that ultimately they would have a full revolution to come back to where they were going to teach the people again which is what leads us to the seventh fire. So the seventh fire was delivered by a prophet who was said to be different from everyone else. Um, he was said to be younger than the rest. He was said that he was described as having a, a different spirit or a strange light in his eyes. And he revealed a time when a new people would emerge who would retrace the steps of their ancestors, the path that was created by their ancestors. Um, collecting what had been left behind, these disparate, these lost and missing pieces of culture and ways of life. Um, but staying strong and using what had been bestowed upon them, the new people will rekindle old embers and ignite the sacred fire of the Anishinaabe. So ultimately, we feel that we are in the seventh fire, that a new generation, a younger generation, has emerged and has walked the path that has been carved out by our elders, that we've been able to locate collect and preserve these ancient ways of life. And in doing that, we're able to create cultural centers as we have today. And heeding to this prophecy is that we're supposed to use these pieces of the old ways to reteach ourselves who it is and what it meant to be Nishnabe. And by using that knowledge, we're able to extend that to our neighbors so that we can then create tolerance and ultimately bring to light what's known as an eighth fire where all cultures and spiritualities will come together to create a stronger humanity. So we ultimately feel that we're in the seventh fire because through our cultural center, we are able to preserve these artifacts as they're known today in these ways and these cultural teachings, create educational programming that we're able to create outreach um, for our community, but also for our neighbors so that they can learn who their Botawadmi neighbors are and hopefully we can create tolerance for the future. The animal that we use to represent this is what we know as Kano. Kano or the eagle. So eagles are associated with very benevolent spirits known as thunderbirds, 
who protect all the four cardinal directions. We see eagle as the animal that can fly highest in the sky. And by doing that, it is closest to creator. So being closest to creator, it can communicate freely with creator. And in doing that, prayers are said to eagle and also for its protection. The eagle also is attributed to a story of a second destruction that the creator wanted to impose upon the people um, as sort of the worst are uh, uh, the worst of humanity, if you will, um, began to come out in the earth's second people. So creator decided to destroy the earth again on the fourth sunrise. Understanding this, the eagle flew to creator and explained to him that he flew over the earth every single day and every night. And he saw people who were still practicing ceremony and living a good way. And if he did that, he would report back to the creator every morning and tell him. And if there is one person, at least one person living on the earth and living in a good way, that the people should be spared. And creator agreed to do this. So every sunrise, we see the eagle and thank them for the sacrifice that they've made to report back to the creator that we still deserve to live here. We still understand what it means to be here and we enjoy every new sunrise and every new day. Thank you. Do we have any questions? <laughs> It's metaphorical um, in a is terms. Is it a period of time, or is it epic, or is it? It is. It is. It is, it is so a it period. So it might be the of first time. period, the second period. That's period. correct. And when were the prophecies for the period? It's really thought of that probably about a, a thousand years ago is when they were delivered. Um, there's some sort of uh, discussion that's had on whether or not all eight prophets um, bestowed these fires to the people in one sitting, or if they came when needed. So as one fire ignited, a prophet would reveal what the meanings were to the people. So the eighth one's already been given? The eighth one hasn't. The seventh has, though. Okay. So there is an eighth fire that some people subscribe to, not everybody. Um, but the eighth fire talks about what's known as a rainbow people. So it means that through this tolerance that's created through the seventh fire, that all people, all races, all religions will come together um, and become one stronger people. And what is the importance of seven? The importance of seven, mm -hmm. there's a lot of use uh, of seven in certain ceremonies, um, especially based upon multiple units and things like that. Um, there's some things I can talk about and some things that I can't, um, but it is an important number. Because in the Old Testament, seven is the uh, uh, sum of three and four, and three represents eternal, and four represents earth, earthly, so the perfect combination of heaven and earth are seven. Is that anything like that with your seven? There's some parallels to it, yes, sir. Okay. What did you say three is eternal? With three is eternal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, but what did you say about four? It's earthly, so the perfect combination is seven. And the other perfect combination is three times four, which is 12, which is perfect community, which is the 12 disciples, 12 tribes. One less than that is six, which represents imperfection or sin. Why are there some you can discuss and some you cannot? Well, I am not a member of the community. Um, I have just worked with the community for so long. Um, and I do have to say, you know, thank you to that. And I appreciate it um, that since my time, since 2005, I've been made to feel like I'm a member of the community. However, knowing that um, I'm in a, an important position, there are also rules and things that I need to abide by that are culturally appropriate. So certain things that I can talk about and certain things that I can't. Even though I may have knowledge on them, it's just not appropriate for me to talk about it. How do the Potawatomi regard the trail of death and forced migration? Um, I mean, there's different perspectives based upon all Potawatomi groups, specifically for those who are removed. I mean, obviously, it's a very tragic time in their lives. I mean, it's unfortunately, it's defining. Um, I think a lot of indigenous communities and non-native communities seem to take these traumatic times in history and it's used to define people when it really shouldn't. Um, but it is a monumental time within their life of, you know, pretty much that, uh, that divide between traditional ways and creating a new life and moving on to the future. 
um, but having to assimilate in some ways to, to decisions that they ultimately made themselves as well. So I think there's a lot of that. There's a lot of reflection that goes into it in terms of initiating and selling land and allowing people to move into that place. So there's reflection in terms of that. Um, but I think there's a lot of strength that's taken from it too, to see how resilient the people are, um, that they've been able to retain and perpetuate cultural ways and teachings and put pass those down to future generations. Um, so it's really seen more of it that way. It's understood to be tragic, but more as a sign of strength. Do they differentiate at all between the those bands who uh, made the treaties and left voluntarily, or more or less voluntarily, versus versus those bands that were forced, literally marched out? There is, and that's kind of the perspective I'm telling, is, is it's a little bit different based upon, say, certain groups that still reside in the Great Lakes, um, that ancestors of those would have been participants of those treaties, but somehow were, and through various means, were allowed to stay. Um, everybody was actually forced to remove except for two specific communities. Um, but ultimately everybody fled back or migrated back to the Great Lakes or during removal people fled and they were absorbed into other indigenous communities. Ultimately they came back out, joined back together and then were recognized as descendants of a certain group of people. Um, but not commonly, I mean there's really not any you know, disputes, um, any tension between that at all. What's the current extent of the relationship between uh, communities where you are all down there uh, and those up in kind of northern Indiana, lower Michigan? Everything's really positive. Um, for about the last 25 years, there has been what we call a gathering of nations, so it's all Potawatomi groups. So the second uh, federally recognized tribes here in the United States, there's two First Nations that are recognized in Canada, but there are actually four what we would call three fires Again, referring to Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi people. Um, we know them as three fires in Anishinaabe communities. Um, they're not federally recognized, but we recognize them as uh, groups, um, as kinfolk. Um, but everybody gets along really well. Um, so at the end of July, uh, first part of uh, August, everybody gets together in their own respective locations. And then that'll sort of cycle through all the different locations. And what it is, it's a means for one, everybody getting together but it's also a way of sharing new things, um, exciting new developments in the community as well. So the migration pattern for the Potawatomi that were here, they come southerly and west from Niagara, or would they have come south? Ultimately, they would have- All the way over to Green Bay, yeah. Uh, ultimately, they would have started coming south a little bit. There would have been fragment groups that started breaking off that way, but the main body of the group went all the way sort of doubled back or started to split apart from there. How did, how did the Anishinaabe immigration interact with other clans from this area? Or did they? How did they interact with the tribes from here? Yeah. There's a lot of history to that too. So from the initial migration, um, then you have to start thinking about sort of colonial times when people started coming in. So from the east when the Dutch and then eventually the British and the Iroquois started to move in, which is probably around the 1620s. Um, they started to come in and wanted to occupy the area. Ultimately, the Potawatomi, who had not made European contact at that point, had to flee north. Ultimately, they went over the strait and then became uh, refugees, essentially, in Wisconsin. Um, and at that point, the Potawatomi and the Odawa started to set up huge trading centers, which is what enticed French Canadian explorers to start moving into that area. Um, but ultimately, once they were able to create that bond, started to acquire European firearms, they could leverage the battlefield at that point. And once they started to do that, then they started to migrate back down into this area particularly, which would have been traditionally home to the Miami, um, but they started to move back into this area. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. But there were, there were frequent disputes there was disputes when they moved over into Wisconsin between the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk, um, but there was just such a large migration of people. Um, but it also kind of speaks to um, the culture of warfare amongst Anishinaabe and Potawatomi people. Um, they were highly sought out by colonial powers to become allies because um, of this cultural component that they had within them. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
remind me of how they viewed the, the American Civil War and what you know what their response was to it. You know, did they did they split you know sides to what happened? Well. For what we know of, for citizen Potawatomi people, uh, at that point they would have already been removed to Kansas. So that entire population of removed people sided with the Union. Now some people stayed neutral. Um, but there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between the Civil War and the American Revolution. That people hearken back to these um, fires, specifically the fourth fire when it talks about coming with a uh, face of friendship or, or being a foe. As you look more into that prophecy, what it says is, is that if they come with sadness and sorrow, and you can see that they have the face of the foes to turn your back on them, ultimately these people will consume themselves. So during the American Revolution, there were some people who sided with the Americans or the British. Really, that was because of proximity to specific settlements, but most people stayed neutral. And some people have even interpreted, elders talk about it being humorous, that people standing back and seeing this this prophecy coming to light that these people now who were one strong people who have defeated their allies and their intertribal alliances are now split into two because of greed and beginning to fight each other. So ultimately they thought that they would consume each other. Same thing during the Civil War. However, things had changed quite a bit. Um, particularly this time, now you had children who were already being removed. They were in early boarding schools, mission schools, and things like that. But oftentimes those schools were seen as um, sort of enlistment points for soldiers. Same thing with World War I. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If um, I did a land acknowledgement for where I live, what would it be? It depends upon where you live. <laughs> In Plymouth. Um, ultimately, I think the, the best way to start that out is to reach out um, to your local group to reach out to the Pokagon Band, speak with them on what they think the appropriate verbiage would be. But I think ultimately building relationship is more important initially than just securing a land acknowledgement. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you recommend a specific book or resources or maybe more than one to um, for our future For this particularly, yeah, there is there is an actual, a really good book. Um, it's called the Mashomes book. It was, you can say written, um, really just sort of recounted on paper um, by a high-ranking Medewan priest known as Eddie Benton Benet. Um, he was also one of the founding members of the American Indian Movement. Um, but he was uh, Ojibwe Anishinaabe. Um, so he's the one who recorded these stories. And these stories are what are told within the Medewan Lodge. Mishomis? Medellin and the uh, last name of the author? Uh, Benay, B-E-N-A-I. Like, Mishom, yes. Are these books available through the po Citizen Potawatomi Nation? They're available through our gift shop, yes. Yeah. But you can also find them on Amazon. But it, it, you can always go to their website and look at the different books as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What was the name of that book that you just was, what was the name of the book? Mishomis? And how do you spell that? M-I-S-H-M-O-S. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. Yes. We have a family unit with the Native American like that, as we understand it today, with our family units that you know, they marry and all that stuff. They are. I mean, and, and some people see it really more traditional as well. So, I mean, if people really adhere to what their clan membership would be based upon their family, especially the region in which that they live, even though that they're removed and, and settled and things like that. People still, you know, follow the cultural ways, still follow what clan that they and the rules that they need to abide by within that clan, still hold ceremonies, still hold feasts. It's still very important. I mean, for our community, we every year we honor seven um, of what we would consider our 49 founding families who came down from Kansas to Oklahoma. What is, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. What is the native population of Shawnee? 
the Native American? The Native population, I'm not sure, but for citizen Potawatomi, it's 34,800. Wow. So I think we're still the ninth largest federally recognized tribe. This building? It's in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Okay. So in between Shawnee and Tecumseh. Is that the main like museum for your It things? is. Yeah, this is our cultural center. Funny enough, many people uh, misconstrue this as being the administration building, so we get a lot of people who come in wanting benefits and things like that. We have to refer them to the small orange building down the road. <laughs> We're lucky enough to get the brand new cool building. Um, but yeah, here um, it also it homes our, our museum. It also has our archive, our research library, um, as well as our educational programming. Um, we have a classroom. We also have a, a, an AV studio where we, we create uh, educational programs there as well. Can I, can I add one thing? Sure. I would really encourage you guys to go online and look at the website. You can visit the museum and see their galleries. It's just absolutely wonderful. So please do check that out. Um, I, Enjoyed it immensely in the time we've worked together. Uh, so if you want to go in there, we have a virtual tour of the museum. We have tons of resources that you guys can access. Um, probably one of our most exciting, it's not available to the general public, it's only for the community, um, but it's a genealogical website. It's kind of like Ancestry.com, um, but just for the community itself. Um, but people are able to go in there, um, do genealogical research, create family trees. There's also a social media component to it, so you can befriend other researchers. You can see if they've been frequenting you know, certain families or certain records that you've been researching. You can reach out to them and then you can create authorities on whether or not you want to communicate or if you want to share resources, if you guys want to combine resources. It's really cool, and, and since we unveiled to the public in 20, June 2020, 2021, we have nearly 20% of the tribal population interacting with the program. Wow. Can I say one other thing? Sure. Um, something else that the um, CHC created for us during the grant project is a language interactive, so when the gallery opens upstairs um, tomorrow, be sure that you take a look at that. Could, could you talk a little bit about the language and just some of the things you told me in terms of the concepts and that kind of thing? Sure. Um, something that we focus on in, during language programming at the, at the community itself, not just at Cultural Heritage Center, is what the cultural ties are to the language. I mean, oftentimes we use language, we really don't think about the etymology or the root of, say, English language because it's just a hybridization of different dialects. Um, but for Potawatomi, that's the most important thing, is knowing what the roots, what the true meanings and interpretations of these words are. Um, so that's really what we focus on, is that we dive deep into the etymology of the words so people know that these do have cultural roots and cultural meanings to them, and what that means to be interpretive in ways in which that you see the world differently, not as an English speaker, but as a Potawatomi speaker, as a Potawatomi person. It's really the way in which that you're seeing, interpreting, and describing the world around you. So one example that I used, um, and it's on the interactive up there, is the way that you say hello, you say bojo to people. A lot of people think because of the, the French alliances, the strong connection, that it was derived from bonjour. It's not. What bojo uh, really means is, is that it's honoring Nana Bojo, um, the spirit of original man. So. The way in which that the community understands Nana Bojo, as I kind of described, is that he's a teacher, um, but he is the spirit, the essence uh, of original man who was first placed on earth. Um, but stories tell us that Nana Bojo would travel between the physical and the spiritual worlds and he would gather teachings and he would bring those back and gift them to the people. However, on his last quest, if you will, um, it was said that when Nana Bojo returns that he would come back in a different form. Nobody knew what that form was. So when you meet somebody new, you say, Bojo, honorably asking that person, are you Nana Bojo? Have you come back to us? So that's, that's the meaning for Bojo. When you post a new update, say yes. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> you want to get a drink? <laughs>
And hopefully you guys enjoy the language interactive. Um, you know, every, every word isn't that way. There isn't a whole lot of deep meaning interpretation, but the majority of, of the language is built that way. Um, we just do a, a really brief um, sort of introduction in that in the language interactive, but it's extremely meaningful knowing that uh, that the roots of these words are really what bind, what connect people, not just to the language um, and being ways to be communicative to each other, but who they are to the ancestors. Blake, I have a question. Lately, we hear a lot about, well, you shouldn't wear this or you shouldn't wear that because you're appropriating a culture. Um, and yet you sell Native American jewelry and you sell those items in your gift store. Can you explain to us how the, how the Native Americans feel about that? I mean, if I have, if I have something that I purchased in Arizona, say that is uh, from a museum or something, am I allowed to wear that? Is, how is that perceived? I'm sorry. <laughs> thought this was going to be lighthearted. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think there's some, there's some fine lines that are in there and some very defining lines that are in there. Um, we've had these discussions as well as to things that we sell as well as other communities sell. Um, is we're not necessarily selling or allowing people to appropriate or dress up as or make believe as. It's a way in which people are able to take something that they were exposed to. It's sort of like a learning tool, something that they're able to see, reflect on, and share. It's also a way to create dialogue. I mean, as people who visit the cultural center and learn what an indigenous community is, that it still exists, that it's a thriving people, and that there are things that they want to give and share back to you, again, referring to the prophecies, is for you to take that little bit of knowledge and hopefully educate somebody else. That seems like a lot and pretty deep. I mean, just acquiring like a turquoise ring, but even that in itself can be an important piece of dialogue, an important piece of understanding of just what you experience at the cultural center. Mm -hmm. Just because it's being sold does not mean that we're okay with people wearing or appropriating things. I think when people are wearing things that are strongly appropriating them, they know what they're doing. Yeah, and I think other people who do that know that as well. But I think it's also, you know, and it can be misleading, you know, it can be misconceived as well. I think there, most people are probably pretty good natured in what they're wanting to wear, whether it be a Pendleton shirt or a Pendleton jacket or whatever they want to do. Some people have very, you know, very strong convicted thoughts on what that is and nobody should wear that. But there are also indigenous people that don't think that they should be wearing Pendleton things and selling Pendleton because of the very tumultuous history between Pendleton and indigenous groups as well. But there are, there's a lot of gray to that. But I think, you know, when people are wearing war bonnets for a Halloween costume and, and thinking that they're dressing up that way, or there are mascots that are using terminology that is um, derogatory, or that they're made aware that it's being derogatory, I think that's the biggest thing is that when indigenous communities reach out and say, hey, you know, we're opposed to you using this, let us explain why, and then people disregard that. I think that's the, that's sort of the, the stake in the heart, if you will. And sort of what I was talking about again is, is that it's still very rare for people to reach out to indigenous communities and say, hey, we wanna work with you. Hey, we respect, you know, you, you know, your perception of things, you telling your own story, understanding the way in which that you see the world through a different lens, can you help us understand that as well? And that's why it's so appreciative. And you know, and thank you again for that. But you know, there's not really a clear defining line. I mean, unless you know, the purposes of what it's being used for are in no way meant to be honorable. No communication has been made again. You know, through a land acknowledgement and things like that. It's great, and it's you know, it's trendy. But if you haven't made actual inroads or communication with the community that you're wanting to honor, you know, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for them? What is it for? And I think that's what it kind of speaks to is the deeper meaning of things. Thank you. Yes, sir. Wait, what, I'm not familiar with the uh, relationship between uh, Pendleton and indigenous people. What, what's that story? 
sorry. Um, I think people have a misconception that there's this really closely tied relationship that you know Pendleton works with native farmers and they're True. and they're able to use native waterways and lands and they do these traditional ways and that's not the fact. I mean it's there are there are many ways in which designs and symbolism are appropriated that indigenous communities have not approved for them to use. Um, misrepresenting the relationship with indigenous communities is you know, an, another way in which uh, really disturbs some communities in that way. Um, so it's really turned a lot of communities off in wanting to purchase, utilize those goods. I mean, there's a lot of symbolism in using Pendleton blankets in the way in which that they're gifted. Some communities, you know, they have their own representation, their own utilization for those blankets in themselves, despite what the relationship might be. Other people are more convicted in their ways and their thoughts. Um, so they feel as if that, you know, Pendleton shouldn't have a place in indigenous communities. That's interesting. I was not aware of any of that. Yeah. I think a lot of people get confused because it's so aligned with, you know, indigenous ways. And that's sort of the marketing strategy for Pendleton, which is somewhat disturbing to indigenous communities. Anybody else? Any other question? One small question. Yes. Have the uh, casinos that have been established been beneficial to the tribes as far as spirituality and education for the young people? They have. They have. Um, I think there's a, you know, and even with the community, there are disputes that arise between the need for utilization of casinos and where that funding goes, how it's spent. Um, and there's always going to be that way between, you know, government and constituents. Um, but ultimately, that's why people are elected to do what they do. Um, but casino is just one avenue for revenue for most communities. I know it's the most uh, visible. It's the most notarized and seen for indigenous communities. But if you just begin to understand the community itself and not really dig too deep below the surface, you'll see that there are other um, monumental ways in which revenue is created from infrastructure to creating water uh, or controlling water rights um, through gover government aspects to different municipal and federal cooperatives. Um, those are really the revenue generating um, avenues for communities. Casinos do help um, and most of those things because of it being gaming revenue, it actually goes mostly towards like educational purposes and stuff like that. And then the other avenues go to uh, community development beyond education. 